you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew, looking at the 26th, 27th chapter. Matthew 27. If you would, uh, please stand with me. Um, if you're here in person with me, stand with me as I read uh, just verses 40, 45 and 46. Uh, this is what it says. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama samothati, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for today. And Lord, if we are here this morning and we have little faith, I pray that you would strengthen it. Father, as we think about uh, our country, we think about your church, we think about our lives, we need the precious reviving again. And Lord, as we walk through this text this morning, and build on where we've been the last few weeks, I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that what Jesus said would sink down deep. It would go through our minds, into our hearts, and it would challenge us at the very fiber of our being. God, I pray for myself that you would cleanse me of my sin and that today I would be a tool that is in your hand and used. God, bless us now that we may in turn be a blessing to others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In a hospital room, a little girl lies quietly. She's got a strange form of cancer that has the doctors baffled. Just two weeks ago, she, seems, she seemed fine. She's running and playing outside with her friends. No signs of sickness whatsoever. It happened so quick. Now she's extremely sick, and the doctors don't say it, but there's doubts she'll make her 10th birthday. The girl's mom tries to be brave for her little girl. It's not easy. She would never say these words out loud, but she wonders, why has God forsaken us? In a different city, a mother rises early at 5.30. It's another busy day. She quickly showers, gets quietly ready, and her four children are still asleep. Before 7, they're all four going to be gone uh, on their way, uh, the children to daycare and the mom to work. She works hard all day. At quitting time, she rushes to pick the kids up, and as she goes home, she uh, uh, prepares uh, supper for the children, and then she has, uh, cleans up all the dishes, then she has that read me a story time, bath time, and then finally bedtime for the children. Then after a few minutes staring at the TV, she goes to bed exhausted, knowing that 5.30 comes early the next morning. She sleeps alone. She's by herself at home, and she wonders at night, why has God forsaken me? Not many miles away, a middle-aged man sits with his hand, his head in his hands. He got up that morning to go to his job, and then at 2.45, his boss came and said, Charlie, I've got bad news. In a blink of an eye, it was all over. After 19 years, four months, and six days, there's nothing left to show for it but a pink slip. How's he explaining that to his family? How's he explaining that to the bank mortgage, the, the ones who, who hold the mortgage? He's got kids that have needs. In anger, he cries out, why have you forsaken me? As I've read our text to us today, it's Friday morning in Jerusalem. Another hot day. It's killing time. The Romans are crucifying that day, and death is in the air. Word has spread to every corner of the city. The crowd gathers at the end of town just outside the city on the hill there called Skull Hill, and the Romans like that there because that's a main thoroughfare into the city, a main road, and lots would see what happens when you go against the Roman Empire. That day, it was a, a, a crucifixion day for those Romans, but on this day, there were more people gathered, it seems, and uh, there was a man named Jesus being crucified, and word has spread like wildfire that he would be crucified. 
You see, his reputation preceded him, and no one was neutral. Some believed, some uh, many doubted, and a few hated. But at 9 a.m., the crowd was rowdy, they were loud, they were obnoxious, and like some athletic event, and they cheer, they laugh, and they shout, and they begin to take wagers on who would last the longest of the three crosses. It appears that the man in the middle will not last long. He's already severely been beaten. It looks like four or five soldiers have just wore him out the night before. His face is all swollen up. He's bleeding from everywhere. His skin is like tatters on the back, and uh, they think he's not going to last long. And the blood is just trickling out of his body. So far, we've heard this one on, in the middle, on the middle cross, Jesus say, Father, forgive them. We also heard him say, uh, respond to a, a, a request, uh, remember me. And then we saw the promise of paradise. Then we saw that Jesus last week spotted his mother and he speaks to her in a very gentle way. And then it happened at noon, the sixth hour. Uh, don't miss what the scripture says. It says, darkness fell upon the land. Be honest, I've read that many, many times, many, many years, and never really thought about what that phrase means. But think about it. It happened, I believe, so unexpectedly. No one uh, thought it was coming. One moment, the sun was right overhead, and then the very next moment, it had disappeared. Darkness had come over the land like a shroud just covering everything. It was darkness without any light whatsoever. Uh, it was a chilling blackness that was unsettling. And I can see it in my mind. I can see it. And along with that darkness, there was probably a, a, a scary silence. All the shouting, all the yelling, all the cursing, all the bedding and yelling. With the darkness, I'm sure the silence began to fall. Something kind of eerie is going on in the darkness. If you read Scripture, it lasted three hours, about 12.30 and 1.15, still dark, uh, 2.20, still dark, uh, 2.45, still dark. But at 3 p.m., just as the darkness had appeared, it disappeared. I'm sure with that kind of shock and all of a sudden the voices began to whisper and they talk about, well, what happened here? They're probably rubbing their eyes from the, the bright light of the day. Panic's probably on their faces, and they probably have confusion uh, talking about what's happened, and they're wondering, what in God's name is going on here? So let's zoom in at that moment on the one on the middle cross, uh, that so-called preacher named Jesus. It's clear as they look, his, the time is about to end. He's at the nearly at the point of death. His strength is nearly gone. His struggle is almost over. He's, he's pushing up on that, uh, from his feet on that center nail, and he, as he pushes up the pain, he's excruciating, and, and he gasps for air as he's standing up, and then he slouches back over, and it's just a repetitive thing. And he's getting his chest heaves, and with every breath, his moans have turned in almost to a silent whisper. And then I believe it's at that moment as we read that all of a sudden, forcefully from his mouth came these words, shouting, Eli, Eli, lama samothani. And you think, what, what does that mean? And those words are familiar. They, they were in Aramaic, the common language of that day. But when he made that statement, he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, as we read those words, I don't think that we understand the, the, the weight of what Jesus was saying. And to read those words and to think about what they mean, I believe, is really to walk on holy ground. And just like Moses before the burning bush, we had to walk very carefully. So what do those words mean that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As we look at those words this morning, let me say up front, my words are inadequate to express the entire meaning of what, I'll tell you what I understand and what I know, but there's so much more that I think that's so much there that I, I just can't grip it, I don't believe, because of the weight of who said and who it was said to. Some have suggested that this cry uh, from the cross uh, was from Jesus' physical suffering. As he made that cry, he was suffering so physically, and there's no doubt we know that Jesus suffered horrifically. Can't imagine going through what he went through. And as he hung on the cross there for six hours in that hot Palestinian sun, 
You know, he's there and he's experienced all that he has. And there are others who, who would say, no, that, his cry from the cross when he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? They, they look at it from a different angle like a cry of disillusionment to, as if Jesus was saying, I failed the mission. Why has God forsaken me? Those who might have that thought, I would say, read the rest of the story, Sherlock. He didn't stay dead. He arose victoriously. But notice that word that what Jesus said. He addressed God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? And what a word. Why have you forsaken? That means to abandon. That means to desert, to disown, uh, to turn away, to utterly forsake. Why have you forsaken me? And please understand, when Jesus made this statement, uh, why have you forsaken me? It was not because he just felt forsaken. It was because he was. Literally, truly, actually, God the Father abandoned his own son. Now, think about this. I, I shared this on social media this week. Jesus was the first and only God-forsaken person in all history. Interesting to note to me as I studied this afresh and anew that this is the only time in Scripture where Jesus addressed God as my God. Everywhere else that you read, he calls him Father. So there's a difference. There's something's happened and transpired on the cross. He says, my God, my God. So when Jesus was on the cross, God abandoned his son. He turned his back on him. He disowned him. He rejected the one and only begotten son. Now that brings us to a question of crisis, really, I think. Why would God do such a thing? Something must have happened on that cross when Jesus was hanging there that had never happened before. And I want to, that's where I think we don't understand the weight of everything that Jesus said. At the precise moment, Jesus was bearing the sin of the world. During those three hours of blackness, in those moments immediately afterward, Jesus felt the full weight of sin of the world rolled onto his shoulders. All of it. All of my sin. All of your sin. Our sin became his. Now we know that he was not guilty of anything. But while he was on the cross, he bore our sin and he bore all of it. Now, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, uh, it makes a statement that kind of helps us understand more of what was actually happening. It tells us that God is so holy that he cannot even look upon evil. Now, when you think about that, another translation of that same verse is God can't stand the sight of evil. So here we have God's holiness looking at his only begotten son who had never sinned, looking at him as all the sin of the world was rolled and hurled upon him. God's holiness demands that he turn away. God's not going to have a part of sin. His holiness recoils from wickedness. So when God looked down and saw Jesus on the cross bearing the sins of the world, he didn't see his son. No, instead he saw the sin that he was bearing. And I believe it's at that awful moment the father turned away, not in anger at the son. and No, he loved his son just like always. He turned away in anger over the sin of the world and that it sent his son to the cross. He turned away in sorrow and I believe in deepest pain because of what sin had done. He turned away in a revolt against the ugliness of sin. And when he did that, Jesus not just felt alone, he was alone. Jesus, who had always had perfect fellowship with the Father, Never anything in between them. All of a sudden, he is completely forsaken, God forsaken, abandoned, deserted, and disowned. He died alone 
for you and for me. Jesus was really and truly forsaken by God. Listen to what 2 Corinthians tells us. It says, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, that's Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So think about that. The sinless one was made sin for us. And when God looked down that day, he saw not his sinless son, he saw my sin and your sin, and he had to turn away. Also in Galatians uh, chapter 3, it tells us this, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, it says, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now think about this. When Jesus was baptized, what did the voice uh, say from heaven? It said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We know that scripture, right? And at the cross, this beloved son became a curse for you and for me, for us. Then in Isaiah, it tells us in chapter 53, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. <laughs> We're all guilty, right? We've all gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him. Who's the him there? Jesus. On him, the iniquity of us all. Now think about that. All the iniquity, all the evil, and all the crime, all the hatred in the world, all of it was laid upon Jesus as he was on the cross. As it says, Jesus became a curse for us. He died in our place. He, all of it was laid upon him. And it was for that very reason, and that's the only reason, that God the Father forsook his son. Now here's kind of a way to kind of get your hands around that. Imagine somewhere in the universe there is a, a cesspool. And in that cesspool it contains all the sins of the world that have ever been committed. It's deep, it's dark, it's foul, it stinks. All the evil deeds that man has done, all the evil deeds that women have done, it's all just floating in that cesspool. Then imagine that in that cesspool there's a, a pipe of filth that is coming in every day for all the evil that is committed every day, just pouring right into that cesspool. Now imagine as Jesus is on the cross, God's only begotten Son, that cesspool is poured all over him. And when God looked at his son, he saw the cesspool of sin emptied all over him. He turned from his sight. Now think about that. All the lust in the world was there. All the broken promises were there. All the murder was there, all the killing, all the hatred, all the theft, all the adultery, all the pornography, the drunkenness, the bitterness, the greed, gluttony, drug abuse, crime, cursing, disregard for God's truth or God's standard. Every vile deed, every wicked thought was laid upon Jesus when he hung on that cross. So, my friends, because Jesus was forsaken, we should never minimize the awfulness of sin. Today, when you mention sin in society, in the public place, you have some who will wink at it. They'll kind of laugh it off. It's really that not big of a deal. Sometimes uh, we're guilty when we make this statement. Have you said this? The devil made me do it. I'm sure we have. As if something, sin is something that we can joke about. But it was your sin and it was my sin that Jesus bore that day. It was our sin that caused his father to turn away from his only begotten son. It was our sin floating in, uh, in that cesspool of iniquity that he became a curse for, paying that price that 
needed to be paid. And my friends, sin is not to be joked about. It's not to be laughed about. It's not to be winked about. That sin that we laugh at and wink at cost Jesus his very life and caused Jesus to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But also when we think about sin, we, when we think about Jesus was forsaken, we should never minimize the incredible cost of our salvation. Now, is it possible that someone who's born again, a follower of Jesus, to get tired of hearing about the cross? We would rather hear oftentimes about happier things rather than the cross. I want you to hear me very carefully. Without the awful pain of the cross, there would be no happy things to talk about. Nothing. Without the cross, there would be no forgiveness. There would be no salvation. There would be nothing. We'd be lost forever. There would be no hope. Without the cross, we'd still be in our sins. It cost Jesus everything to pay that price. And that price was where he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So let's never make light of the cost of our salvation. Now, let me ask you a question. Why or how would a follower of Jesus not want to hear about the cross? This is what your preacher thinks. This is what I think. I think we don't want to hear about the cross. We don't want to think about the cross or read about the cross or sing about it oftentimes because we know that our lives don't line up to God's standard. We don't want to hear about the cross. We don't want to hear about the price that was paid for us because the price he paid demands more than our present self-serving, lazy attempt at following him. It demands more. That's one reason why we don't want to attend church or watch online consistently because we're being reminded of that price that Jesus paid and our lack of love and our lack of commitment is exposed. On the cross, Jesus was forsaken by God the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken. He was deserted. His dad turned his back on him. And when he hung on that cross, he hung alone. I was thinking about him hanging alone on the cross, forsaken by his father. I think uh, he... That cry of loneliness is for the abandoned child or the widow or the divorcee struggling to make ends meet or that mother who's standing over the bed of a suffering daughter. That father who's out of work or that prisoner in a cell or that the age they're living in, the, in, a, in a languish in a, in a nursing home. Wives that have been abandoned by their husbands and singles who celebrate their birthdays alone. Jesus was forsaken. He was deserted. His dad turned his back on him. And it's hard to make that statement and then say, thank God it's true. Thank God it's true. Jesus was forsaken so that you might never be forsaken. Jesus was abandoned so that you might not never be abandoned. He was deserted so you wouldn't have to be deserted. He was forgotten that we might never be forgotten. He paid the price for our sin, for all that who would believe. Now let's think for a moment. We know this scripture so well, we could probably quote it from our hearts, almost probably backwards. But look, look, look afresh and again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to make a few hard statements. And I'll make them because I love you. If you die in your sin, we know we're all sinners. If you die in your sin, separated from God, you'll go to hell in spite of what Jesus did. Jesus took the blow. He took the pain. He endured the suffering. He took the weight of all the sin so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. If you go there, you can't blame Jesus. It's not his fault. 
He went to the place of being God forsaken to pay that penalty so that you could be saved. Now, I was thinking about this. What, what is the worst thing about that place called hell? I would suggest it's not the fire, though the fire is real. Read scripture. I would say it's not the memory, but the memory is certainly real. They'll, they'll remember things. I'd say it's not the darkness, though the darkness is certainly real. The worst thing about hell, it is that place in the universe where people go, will go and be utterly and forever forsaken by God. It hurts my heart to say that. But that's the hell of hell. To be in hell is a place where God has abandoned you for all eternity. And we know we're all guilty. Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. Scripture is emphatic and it's very clear. And left to our own ability and our own works, hell is our future home. But the good news is that our sin, Jesus bore on the cross... Jesus died a sinner's death and took a sinner's punishment so that guilty sinners like you and like me could be eternally forgiven. A few weeks ago, we looked at the two thieves on the cross, on the crosses on the, either side of Jesus. He was on the center one. Each one of those thieves made a decision about Jesus. You see, with Jesus, you cannot be neutral. In fact, everybody in person today, everybody in the parking lot, everybody watching online will this moment make a decision about Jesus. You can't be neutral. You'll either agree with what the Scripture says and embrace it, or you will reject it. We'll all make a decision today. And this is what I really believe. I believe this is a holy moment. And I believe God is speaking to us today. And we're aware of our sin. We, we know the outcome. And let me say this. Don't put off what you should and could do today thinking you have tomorrow as the opportunity. You have no hope of tomorrow. No guarantee. What you have is right now. So... Here in a moment, we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, if you're in person, when Tony hits that first note, and you would say, I know that I'm guilty, I know that I'm separated, but today I am deciding to follow Jesus. No turning back. Step out and come kneel at this altar. Kneel before the God of the universe, the one who gave his only begotten son, whose son bore that penalty on the cross so you could be forgiven and it brought forth that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe today you'd be here or you're watching online and you'd say, I've trusted Christ. There is that moment I look back on and I say, I've trusted Christ. But in light of what Jesus declared with a loud scream from the cross and you look at what it cost him and you look at your half-hearted effort at following Jesus now as you reflect this moment in God's presence you are numb with embarrassment Jesus has been everything but first for you your lack of one, lack of love for the one who gave us all just stares back in the face at you. You've struggled with sin. You've used every excuse for that sin. You've thrown in the towel. You've given up. And after all, you say, well, I was just born in sin. That's how I was born. My friends, hear me carefully. If you have placed your trust in Jesus, you have been born again. And the scripture says very emphatically, old things are passed away. Behold, everything is new if you're in Christ. So it is past time for the follower of Jesus to start acting like it. 
It is past time for us to stand up and be counted. The roll call was being played this morning. And the scripture is very clear that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is good news. It's time today to commit to give our best for the one who cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe it's time to unite with this church. Maybe it's time to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. But I, know, I don't know what your decision is, but I know you do. So today, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, Tony's going to come, and Reed's going to come. We're going to sing that song, and let's sing it from our hearts as a result of what we are going to do this week. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning you've given us. And Lord, I know that as I have read this week about what Jesus proclaimed from the cross, it is hard to understand, to get a grip around all that it really means. God, I pray that today that you have captured everyone's attention. For those that have never trusted Christ, help them understand that you have done everything necessary for them to be saved. And I pray they would embrace your incredible love given, by in, given to us by the giving of your son to pay that penalty with his life. We thank you. He didn't stay dead. We thank you for that. And Lord, help us place our faith this morning in that risen Christ. For those of us who are in Christ, who have been saved, but we have been giving lip service, we have been giving a half-hearted attempt, I pray that today you would receive from us what you deserve. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. <clears throat> so much for being here this morning. Um, may the Lord bless you today. Uh, this week, I'm going to be taking the baby bottles to Haven Care, so if you got those filled, bring them this week. I'm going to probably go over, I'll go over I'll, every day, but I'll go over probably Thursday if you want to get your bottles here. Thank you for doing that. Uh, anything else I need to make mention of? Anything else? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your mercy that's fresh and new this morning. We thank you for that precious reviving that you bring to us as we agree with your truth. We thank you, Jesus, for going so far to the point of being forsaken by Almighty God so that we could be forgiven of our sins. We love you. and It's in your name we pray. Amen.